has noted that um, pesticide stewardship partnerships and best practices for pesticide sampling of surface waters. And that's from Lori Pillsbury, who works for the DEQ. I'll do a brief introduction of her while she hopefully, sorry, I'll make you queue it up. <laughs> while she queues up um, her presentation. And just to note, um, the presentation is not about the Highway 36 exposure investigation or um, the recently publicized sampling efforts in the Lake Creek Basin. Most of you know that, but there was, were some questions about that, so just to clarify that. Um, Lori Pillsbury, who works for DEQ, holds a Bachelor of Science degrees in Biology and Marketing and a Master of Science degree in Chemical Oceanography. She has been working with the Oregon Department of Water Quality, or uh, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality since 2008. She is the Toxics Monitoring and Point Source Projects Coordinator for ODEQ Laboratory in Hillsboro. Prior to moving to Oregon in 2008, she was the Water Resource Assessment Team Manager for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection in Tampa, Florida. Please join me welcome Lori. Thanks. It's great to see so many people turn out to hear about PSP and geology. Her title is much better than mine. Um, so I, uh, as Liz said, am with the DEQ Laboratory in Hillsboro. I recently, very recently, took over the Toxics Monitoring Program coordination from Jim Coyle, who retired a couple weeks ago. But I have been working with it as well, and I did. I do also coordinate all the point source projects that the laboratory does. So those are projects where we may sample around municipal wastewater treatment plants, industrial discharges, those kind of things. So first, I was requested to talk about uh, pesticide sampling in surface waters, and also I wanted to give you a little background on what's called our pesticide stewardship partnerships. I, uh, Kevin Masterson in our headquarters is the coordinator for this program, and I have his contact information. There is this, a, a, a column on the sign-in sheet that says if you'd like a copy of the presentation from me, feel free to check that, and then uh, Liz will email me a list, and I can send that to you by email. I didn't want to print it. I never know how many people are coming or who wants it, so I can just email it to you. So let's start out with PSP. So the Pesticide Stewardship Partnerships are partnerships between agencies and landowners and industrial companies and agricultural companies all within the watershed. And what the stewardship partnerships do is they monitor for current use pesticides that are being used in the watershed. They look uh, in surface waters for impact from drift and runoff of pesticide applications. They identify streams, with this monitoring, we identify streams that may have elevated concentrations and then collaborate with these partners that are established to implement voluntary best management practices. It's not a regulatory program, it's a voluntary program, and it's very much dependent on the partnerships within the watershed. As we implement the BMP practices, the best management practices, we also then follow up with the monitoring, so continue to monitor, to make sure and look for, to, to make sure that we have improvements over time, or if we're not seeing improvements, reevaluate those best management practices to see how we should change them or maybe institute something different. So as I said, this was very dependent on partnerships and the partners need to be identified very early in the process. It includes watershed councils, OSU, integrated pet, plant protection centers, tribal governments, uh, grower groups, ag chemical distributors, and state agencies such as DEQ, uh, Department of Agriculture, and Department of Forestry. And with the PSP program, you can see on here what the different partners may do. And currently we have seven PSPs, and I'll show you a map as to where those are. In a second here. Actually, I'm going to show you the map first. We'll skip a little bit. So these are the current, we have seven watersheds as of 2012. And the closest one to this area is the Amazon watershed and the Long Tom Watershed Council is one of the partners for that and the leading sampling partner for the Amazon PSP. It's a little hard to see, but you can see on here the Amazon one focuses on, there's several sites that would be considered urban sites in this watershed, as well as one agricultural and one site before it heads into the agricultural area. The other partners over here include grower groups, OSU, uh, the Soil and Water Conservation District, and as well as the city of Eugene. This PSP began in 2011, but because all of these partners are involved, we actually 
began working on setting up this partnership several years before it, that actually sampling begins. I thought you might like to see a little data from the Amazon Creek Pesticide Stewardship Partnership. This is from 2011. Uh, Kevin Masterson summarized this, and you can see, if you can see. I'm, in, I'm trying to find a way to turn out the light. Okay. There's a variety right of different uh, pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides that were found during the monitoring at these five locations. Some are uh, herbicides such as atrazine. Is a, uh, a pet insect repellent personal care product. We actually find that quite often in Oregon streams. Uh, Diuron is a roadside can be used roadside ditch control, but it is a herbicide. Uh, this is associated a lot of times with uh, homeowners and uh, urban use. Imidacloprid is an insecticide. As you can see, it's a variety of different things that we're finding. But the one thing to notice is we're finding a lot of these things. The in Red here shows the number that are actually over value, and we found diuron once over EPA's benchmark, and that a benchmark establishes a level at which toxicity is expected for the species that the benchmark is for, and that was for the lowest species, which is a plant species, which would be expected being that diuron is an herbicide, so plants would be the most sensitive to diuron. And this down. Oust, I'm not going to struggle with the chemical name, was another product that we found over benchmarks in the Amazon Creek sampling. Lori, what was your detection limits for that? Was it parts per million, billion, billion? No, these, so it's a very good question. The, um, our laboratory has a, a GCMS and we, or sorry, GCMS. You guys can please raise your hand and wave at me and jump around when I start using laboratory terminology. We have a, an instrument that gets down to the nanogram per liter, so that's the, a part per trillion. So it's a very low detection for a lot of these pesticides. This number here, diuron, that in order to be over the benchmark, it will be in the parts per billion range, the low parts per billion. But I don't have the exact data numbers with me. But many of these detections are in very low numbers. I want to go back up here real quick. So as the, we have the monitoring data in the long time now, Kevin will evaluate this data with the partners, and they'll look at the data and the practices that are going on, and they'll institute some stewardship actions in order to address the pesticides that we found in the watershed. So these are some types, for examples, of actions that have been implemented in other watersheds. So the stray, spray drift reduction training and practices, installation of weather stations so they can evaluate when to spray, not to spray when the wind's blowing in direction or blowing hard or that kind of thing, evaluating the weather. Use of biological control, so eliminating the use of pesticides altogether and using integrated pest management and biological controls. Use of less toxic pesticides, and then also establishing buffer strips around surface waters so they're not spraying close to surface waters, and minimize spraying near streams. Minimize spraying during rain events, those kind of things are all implement all actions that have been implemented during the PSP process. And I don't have the slide with me, but in the Hood Basin was our one of the earliest partnerships, and since 2004 to today, the use chlorpyrifos was detected above toxicity levels in the streams in the Hood Basin. But as they implemented some of these actions, it's now down, and now it has not been detected in the last two years. So it's a successful uh, PSP. So now I'm going to skip through. I should have put that in a different order. Sorry about that. So that in summary, what happens is water, we go out and collect water for the Pesticide Stewardship Partnership. We find the detections. We look where are the pesticides of concern, and then we look at what actions we can take, voluntary actions between all the partners in order to address these pesticides. And new projects are happening all the time. There are new stewardships being established. The necessary parts that you need in order to establish one of these programs is, as we all would know, this is probably the most important part of funding. So that's in a variety of ways. Uh, there are grants. This is very expensive for pesticides. 
And so you want to be very aware of what you actually want to look for and what's of a concern in your area. So if you have more detailed questions about the pesticide stewardship partnerships, the program, how it works, how they start, how you can get involved with them. Kevin Masterson is the contact, and he again is our, at our headquarters. He's our toxics reduction coordinator, supervisor, <laughs> man. Uh, he, he can help you with that. And again, I can give you this presentation. So now we'll get into just some best practices for pesticide sampling, and I wasn't sure of the audience and how much sampling you may have done or how much sampling you're interested in doing, so this is it's pretty basic that I'm going to just go through how you think about where you want to sample, what you want to sample, and then I just brought some examples and some information on how to sample, what are the best ways to do that. So the most important part in sampling anything, pesticides or anything, is to plan your study. If you want to have collect defensible scientific data that is valid, you want to plan your study, you need to know what you want to sample, when, where, who, and how. We'll talk a little more about each of these. So what? what first, let's think about what are we going to sample. So what pesticides are applied in the area of interest to you? You can review spray records. You can research the crops that are grown in your area. If it's urban area that you're interested in, you can talk to pest control companies and find out what they might be applying on the outsides of houses, that kind of thing. But research and find out what is applied in your area and what's of concern. The analyses are very expensive for these compounds and to run a scan for everything under the sun that could possibly be out there is very expensive and so you really you really do want to know which ones are the most toxic or which ones present the greatest risk to your ecosystem. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Um, I think we're primarily in this area we're primarily interested in forestry pesticides. Mm -hmm. Do you um, if you could just angle towards that a little bit that would be helpful. Um, you okay. know, we, we don't really have urban areas out here. Okay. So this will just, this slide, and then we'll, it'll be general after that. Okay. So even, so you're interested in primarily forestry herbicides, you still want to know which ones are applied most frequently and in the greatest quantity because oh, sure. there are several herbicides applied. So that will still apply. Yeah. And it also is important because the sample volumes and the analyses and what you need to collect differ by what you're looking for. So that is another important consideration. So when? When, when are they sprayed? Again, spray records research the crops which will be the, or the herbicide. <coughs> when will the sampling occur? What, how, what kind of a sampling event do you want to have? Do you want to have, are you planning to have one sampling event or do you have funding that you may be able to do multiple sampling events? Is this primarily a spring event or a fall event? Do you want to do it in spring and fall? These are considerations because you may limit how many samples you take in spring versus fall if you want to do both so that, as far as funding considerations. And will you plan to sample to bracket application of an herbicide. And if you're going to do that, that is logistically interesting. So <laughs> you will have to really think about that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, in general, the public can't get access to spray records. So I was wondering if you could go into more detail about how to obtain spray records. I don't if you're think not, she knows anything about that. If you're not no, that would be of an agency. The Oregon Department of Forestry would be the agency I would contact to find out. And I really don't know about that. But they, ODF would be the agency to contact. Or even in an urban setting. So in an urban setting, as far as finding out what's applied in an urban setting, I mean, I, so you can call pest control applicators and ask them what they're applying for ants. I, have, I actually was able to get an MSDS from a pest control company and told me they were applying but by fenthrin around people's homes for control of ants. You can also find out, you can just go to your local Home Depot and look at the ingredients on what's being sold on the shelves, look at the active ingredients in those to see what may be urban pesticides of interest or herbicides of interest in your area. 
Surprisingly, there's lots of brand names, but a lot of them have similar active ingredients, and that's really what you want to concentrate on is the active ingredient in the formulation that you see. So where, and this isn't necessarily where are they spraying them, but it's where are you going to look for them, for these pesticides. So if generally herbicides, you probably will find them potentially in the water, but if we are going to expand this to other types of pesticides, you may not find them in the water, you may find them in the sediment. So if it's a, you know, a legacy or an insecticide perhaps, a pyrethroid insecticide, as I mentioned by fenthrin, which is an ant insecticide, you're more likely to find that in the sediment than you are in the water. So looking in the water for that may not be worth your while. And contact experts for assistance. The U of O and OSU have several researchers that are working on pesticide issues in the environment in Oregon locally, and they are always more than happy to talk to people, as well as analytical laboratories can, are good resources to let you know where you should be looking for something. They know the chemical properties of the compound you'd like to look for, and they can tell you where you're more likely to find it, if it's there. Again, university researchers. And then where will you sample? And this is, a, this is something that we struggle with at DEQ, is access, access to the stream. Now, a lot of you live in this area, so if you're sampling waters that you, have, you or your neighbors have access to, that's not an issue, but if you want to sample a location that might be on private property or located up, you know, where you have to request access, that's something to consider, the logistics of it, contacting the landowner and securing permission before entering the property, as well as logistically accessing the water, because I'll show you here in a second why that's important. And then the biggest, one of the biggest things is who, who, who will actually do the sampling? Do you have volunteers to do the sampling? Are you going to do the sampling? And when whoever does the sampling, it's important to go over the sampling protocols with the people that will be sampling, so that you're all sampling the same way, with the same, following the same protocols. And then who will do the analysis? Is, are you going to do a commercial laboratory? Do you have are you able to set up a partnership with the university laboratory? That would probably be a less expensive route than a commercial laboratory. But if you are interested in a commercial laboratory, I, at the end of the presentation, I have some links that can give you information on laboratories in the area list of laboratories that you can find. And most importantly, probably starting with this, who will pay for the cost of the sampling and analysis? And so if you have a group, a watershed council, and stakeholder involvement, you could look at the pesticide part stewardship partnership route and try to secure a grant and grant funding to carry out ongoing pesticide sampling in the area. And also partnerships with local farmers, businesses, and residents may be a way to help fund your sampling. And then how will you do it? You need to develop sampling protocols. It's most important when you collect data to have to be able to say how you collected it and be able to support how you collected it as a valid means of collection and that you followed a protocol collecting it. Will you collect samples to show that you didn't contaminate the sample? Will you collect blanks and duplicates? It's easy to contaminate as other things we sample for, like mercury and some and personal care products. But it's still very important to collect blanks and duplicates if you can. With, your fund, with the funding that's available to you know, have the quality assurance of your data. And then again at the end, how will the data be evaluated and how will it be used? That last question is probably, along with funding, something to answer at the very beginning is how do you, what is the purpose of your data collection and how are you, do you plan to use your data? Now, just some general good sampling practices. I, just brought some props so you didn't have to just look at me. Um, these are typical pesticide sampling bottles that we use. Glass bottles for organic sampling. Plastic is not a good container for sampling organic chemicals. Pesticides being organic chemicals. You uh, are, do not secure the integrity of your sample in a, in a plastic container. It can interfere with the analysis. This would be a good jar for sediment, collecting a sediment sample. I'll set them on there, they might see them. Do you want to pass them around? Sure. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it's very important, so these are pre-cleaned new containers, and if you, if you actually are going to a commercial laboratory, they most of the time will supply you with the containers you need to conduct the analyses. If they don't, if you're not going to a commercial laboratory, a university laboratory perhaps, you can purchase containers from a variety of container suppliers. The most important thing is to maintain the integrity of these containers. Don't open the containers in, in your building and leave them sitting open before you decide to go out and sample. So keep them closed until you're sampling and store them in a covered packaging while you're waiting to go sample. Then another good sampling practice is to protect yourself and the sample. So we always remind people to wear appropriate safety gear. Wear gloves for the protection of the sample mainly. Use new disposable gloves at each site. Avoid gloves that have the powdery stuff in the inside. You don't want to get that in your sample. And then place, protect the sample. Place the sample in a cooler when, as soon as you collect it and put it on ice and chill it and protect it. And collect a good representative sample. So it, as I talked about, logistics are difficult to get to the stream. Sometimes you get down to the stream and all that you have is a little kind of mucky pool that you can reach. That wouldn't be a good representative sample of a flowing system. So you want to make sure you collect a representative sample. And I brought this just so I can see if I can reach across the room. But this is a good sampler to use. These are not expensive. Actually, this part can be purchased at a hardware store. Mr. Longarm, it's a painting, kind of like a roller, painting roller thing. And this can be ordered from Wildco, and I think this is only maybe $35 or $40. But this way, you can extend it way and reach real far out into the stream, so you can get out into the flow and get a sample that's representative, not just a main sample in, in back eddy or something. And this also allows you to dip directly into the sample bottle. You want to avoid intermediate containers if you can at all possible because they just uh, bring question and it bring question to your sample and perhaps you may contaminate your sample with an intermediate container. And these are very high tech samplers <laughs> as you can see. Just a minute. Um, a number of us have done Sampling out here with POSIS devices. Mm -hmm. Can you do you have any information to share with people on that? I did not include POSIS in my presentation about how to sample okay. with POSIS. We have the laboratory has done some work with POSIS, and as has the Pesticide Stewardship Partnership, we've deployed some POSIS in the watersheds up in the hood in Tualatin basins. POSIS samplers can be used for a variety of applications. We find them difficult to use uh, if you want to actually find the water, to get back calculate to the water, there are lots of considerations with POSIS. So how many of you are not familiar with a POSIS sampler? Does anyone, everyone knows what they are? So they're, they're passive samplers. You put them out in the water for 28 days and they collect what's in the water. They integrate it into their membrane and then you take the membrane and extract the samples in the laboratory and measure what has accumulated in that membrane. Over a period of time. Over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's 28 days, but we, we did an experiment where we had 7, 14, 21, and 28 to see a difference. So you can put them out for any length of time that you choose. 28 days tends to be the maximum because they do reach a capacity. They can reach a capacity of absorption. And some of the challenges with POSIS, as far as trying to equate it to a water concentration, are you need to know flow rates, temperature rates, and monitor that through the deployment. There's also biofouling issues and interferences. So an interesting thing, we did a laboratory study where we actually spiked the water and let the POSIS sit in there, and we spiked it with our calibration standards, so it has lots of different pesticides in it. But then we spiked it in addition with extra diuron. So we gave it a big dose of diuron, and we found that with that big dose of one pesticide, we actually didn't accumulate other pesticides. So it, it interfered with the ability for the posts to pick up other things. And so it may not just be pesticides that are doing that kind of interference. If you have a lot of suspended material or you have a lot of another compound in your Water. So those are some of the challenges with POSIS, 
We are still working with POSIS at the laboratory, and we may do another study next year, but we don't routinely use them because we, we have difficulty in interpreting the data. And they also are difficult and very expensive to extract and collect and deploy. And you have a lot of trouble with vandalism and people thinking they're a really cool thing and <laughs> going out there and you find them on the bank, <laughs> which does you no good. <laughs> so, do you have any? That's very really good. Thank you. And so the, one of the last things you do when you're sampling is, in order to maintain your data integrity, is you keep and collect your field information, again, collect the quality assurance samples, and just keep good track of what you did out in the field so that you know how you collected the sample, where you collected the time, and make sure you get it to the laboratory as soon as possible. Don't keep it hanging out in your garage for a week. And maintain the sample custody. Now, that's not as important when you're not talking about a legal sample, we do sampling for the state police, and that's very important to maintain custody, but it's still important to know what the sample went through before it got to the laboratory. And this is just an example of a chain of custody that I had in there. This, in this presentation, one is the Pesticide Stewardship Partnership website, and that includes some, which I don't have with me, QA document, uh, quality assurance documents that actually give you a, a good sampling plan for pesticides and how often to collect blanks and those kind of things. Let's let her finish and then come back to other questions and answers. Okay. Both of those are on that website. Uh, also, DEQ's volunteer monitoring page and um, the Sayusla Watershed Council, I believe, works with Steve Hansen. Yes. To do vo ongoing volunteer monitoring. And that website has a lot of good resources for volunteer monitoring groups, data review, how to review your data, what to look for. Also, uh, information on potential grant funding and different things. And then as well as the laboratory's quality assurance page, which provides information on the field sampling uh, standard practices that the laboratory staff uses when we collect all of our samples. So that is also on that page. And then this, these two references that you can uh, go to, and definitely don't try to write those down, but I can send those to you is the Oregon Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. This is a program that Oregon uh, runs that we go out and inspect uh, laboratories for their quality assurance practices and make sure they're following the standard methods and they actually become accredited. And then this is the, NELAP is the national version of the, or, of the ORLAP program. So both of those links have lists of laboratories that are accredited laboratories. And so that means that you can be a little more sure of the quality of their data because they go through a yearly inspection to maintain their certification. And it involves really strict uh, record keeping, record keeping practices and QA practices at the laboratory. And there's the contact information again for the Toxics Monitoring Program as well as the PSP. And one thing I'll mention that I don't have a slide on is the Toxics Monitoring Program is ongoing in the state. Uh, we're making it through our first year, first five year cycle. And so we've been moving around to different basins within the state. This year we're working in the John Day Deschutes, Hood, and Sandy basins. But next year we're coming to the coast. So we'll be doing the south coast, the mid coast, and the north coast. And we'll be working with people like David to identify sites and land use areas that we, land uses that we should address within the toxics monitoring program. We try, when we go to a basin, we evaluate the land use and we try to choose sites that are representative of all the land uses, at least one, but then, you know, make, put more sites in the heavier land use areas. So if it's more heav heavily urban, then we have more urban sites and we try to look at the land use in the basin. So we do that evaluation. We collect sediment, water, and fish during the toxics program. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Justin, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering if you um, freeze those samples while you're holding on to them for a week before the lab, or you're, you're keeping them on ice? No, we keep them on ice and chill them to less than 6 degrees C. So you just put them on wet ice and they'll get down to 6 degrees C. A lot of pesticide methods need to be uh, what's called extracted at the laboratory within seven days. So you need to get them to the laboratory so that they can set them up and run them. They do an extraction process within seven days. So they have a, a bit of a short holding time. Right? Uh, do you see any uh, bioaccumulation in fish tissues that can give you some idea of 
how that relates to the water quality levels? So we do, when we look at fish tissue, we do look for uh, those kind of contaminants that would bioaccumulate, such as the uh, chlorinated pesticides, legacy contaminants. Currently, our fish tissue sampling is only fillets. So some of the, um, what you would consider emerging contaminants and things, have a different effects on fish, and they don't show up in the fillets because they are not uh, lipophilic, so they don't like the, the fat to get into the fish. So you would see some of those in the kidney and the liver, but you also would see them mimicking estrogenic activity. So you may see changes to reproductive systems and those kind of things that we're not currently looking at changes to the estrogenic effects. So we do see bioaccumulation though with the legacy pesticides. We are finding um, chlorinated pesticides and uh, PCBs in some of our fish samples. And also flame retardants, which is considered a emerging contaminant that's the polybrominated by bifinal bi ether, which you'll find in furniture and things. I think Dan was next and then... Can we request more information about that 7, 14, 28 closest testing that you did to get the different scales and see how, what the, because you guys did it for a reason to see the different times. Uh, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. We can request that. Yes, we can, um, we haven't written any kind of a summary report for you, but we can certainly talk about it and let you know the information. Here. Um, so it looks like historically it's you've been focused primarily on agricultural chemicals, especially insecticides, mm -hmm. and some industrial chemicals. For the just in general. For, or? I mean, it looks like that's what your PSPs are monitoring. So the so. PS, the PSP program, the way that. The PSP program originally came up with their list of analytes is there's a water quality pesticide management team, which involves people from ODF, ODA, Department of Agriculture, Department of Forestry, as well as DEQ and the Oregon Health Authority. And they came up with a matrix that is considered pesticide of interest and pesticide of concern in Oregon. And they looked at use and toxicity and identified those pesticides of interest and pesticides of concern. So that was the original list that they started with, but it has since expanded because now we run a very similar list to our toxics monitoring program, which includes uh, probably about a little over a hundred current use pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides. And by far the most commonly found in our toxics program are herbicides. Dioron is wow. a very common, commonly found herbicide. Right. Gary, if I can, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's fine. If I could add one thing, um, at a side conversation with, um, at a Team BL meeting, not, not Team BL related, but a side conversation, there was a discussion, and there have been some um, of the um, pesticide stewardship monitoring or what a partnerships where they have had forestry as one of the components. I assume that's what you're getting at. And um, it was a, in a place where they looked at agriculture, Forestry and I think urban. Okay, thank you. That's, I, I couldn't remember where it was, but so there is a um, there is there is a precedent a, for forestry monitoring. Yeah, actually, yeah, there's there's a, a, someone from ODF who was telling me about it. The South Yamhill PSP program is actually three sites that are focused on forestry, and then the Yamhill Pesticide Stewardship Partnership looks at the agricultural and urban impacts around McMinnville, the McMinnville right. area. I, I saw on your website it looked like there was a, at least initially, you were angled at water quality standards, uh, drinking water quality standards. That that, we, I'm sorry, that drinking water quality? That we were aiming at drinking water quality? Yeah, that looked like that's how it, that was your initial focus. For the pesticide right. stewardship partnership? Um, I don't think there aren't that actually that many that okay. have MCLs. Drinking water standards. No, there aren't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Hood yeah. was the first. Was Hood the first one, or is that the one we just always hear about? And that was one of the first ones. I'm not sure if that was exactly the first one, but that's the one that we hear about a lot. That's the one that we we have a lot of data ongoing from. They started in 2004, so it may have been. Yeah, and I don't actually one. remember a drinking water component of that one. Well, I I just um, yeah, I just I I read on your website that. Um, this, that the only there are only a few standards for these chemicals. 
and that's true. Um, many of the current use, oops, I'm just trying to, I can actually. In drinking right, so water. Yours is in the mic. And there, are, there really aren't any standards for non drinking water. The, there, the current use pesticides, you're right, there aren't a lot of uh, aquatic life or human health standards in water for current use pesticides. Many of the standards still focus on what we consider the legacy contaminants. Right. And uh, EPA is a little slow in moving and developing of standards, but what we use for our toxics program, and as I, I'm, you can't, I'm sorry, I'm talking sideways, I'm trying to find you the, fine. the chart here. Here it is. Uh, I wonder if this is actually a slideshow. Yeah, if you go to there it is. Okay. So these are the 2012-2013 Oregon pesticides of interest and pesticides of concern. This is what I was just talking about. And the um, the red ones are pesticides of concern. So these are the bigger focus due to that we've potentially found them in toxic amounts in the water, or they're more toxic, or and used at a a higher rate, so you'll see we have um, atrazine and herbicide, carbaryl, which is an insecticide beside, uh, diuron and it's an herbicide, so it is uh, a variety of different chemicals. But uh, what we do in the toxics program is we, when we monitor for current use pesticides, we evaluate for our reporting and for our data evaluation against the Office of Pesticide Programs has established benchmarks for current use pesticides, and they give you uh, toxicity values for invertebrates, uh, vertebrates, and plants. And so we try to look at that as an indicator of whether we should be concerned about an area Great. before we have water quality standards. Let's do two more questions. Ray, I think you're next. Or you're the only hand. <laughs> I see that you've got um, copper pesticides up there. So it's not necessarily organic pesticides, so you're looking at inorganic? Right, so for this is yeah. the, um, the pesticide management team establishes this matrix and right. they'll look at any, uh, uh, they establish it not related to it only being organic or it only being inorganic. So they Did they consider um, the lead pesticides that were used as legacy on orchards all over Oregon? I don't see lead pesticides up there, but we do monitor for lead in sediments and in the water column under our toxics monitoring program. So we do look for lead. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm thinking about that the, a lot of those formulations up there have chelators in them. Mm -hmm. And the chelation can take the metals like the copper and the trees where normally they'd stay in the roots. Mm -hmm. And so if you spray some of these formulations on an orchard that has legacy contamination from the metals, then that needs to be looked at as well. Exactly. So. All right. Thank One you. last question. No. Oh, okay. go for it if you want. No, no question. Oh. Thank you. Uh, oh. So, and you, you, you brought up drinking water, and, and it kind of makes me think that you might have been looking at the drinking water program, which also oh, monitors toxics mm -hmm. in drinking water supplies and because they're funded differently than Lori, um, it is a separate program, but you know, actually a lot of the same people are involved in, in terms of our lab um, from an analytical standpoint. But for instance, in um, July this year, I know that uh, a number of the surface water supplies are going to get toxics monitoring essentially at the drinking water source intakes. And so the um, Sokus and Wobink lakes are two of the surface water supplies in the mid-coast basin, and I think they may be the only ones, but not the only ones on the coast that are, you know, getting a toxics monitoring program, if you will, but not associated with either of the two that were <laughs> mentioned here. And again, it's just really different sources of funding. Um, but they look at it specifically in terms of drinking water protection and then in comparison to any standards that, that might apply for human exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, since we, the lab does do all three programs, the source water will be analyzed for the same set of analytes as the toxic monitoring program, so the data is comparable. We won't have right. like one over here and one over here. Has the PERS system been useful at all? Has the, I'm sorry. PERS, per, Pesticide use reporting system. Been useful to us? To you, yeah. 
Uh, no, not to me personally. I don't find it. I mean, to DEQ. Very useful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's. Uh, I don't even think it's kept up any longer. No, it isn't. It's it like one practice. one report in 2008, right, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, I don't think it's kept up anymore. So. Kevin Masterson is really useful to me. <laughs> He's a wealth of pesticide knowledge. Great. Anything else? So feel free. I mean, if, if you're interested in my in the presentation or more information, just check that box and I'll send you an email. My cards are actually out there on the table somewhere hiding. So if you feel free to grab them and email me if you have more questions. Thank you.